Let's turn to our Bibles and we're looking at 2 Peter 1, verses 16 to 21. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellency of glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice, which came from heaven, when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to hear as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy or scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. I invite Wayne to come up and bring God's word to us. Happy New Year, and it's great to be here sharing uh, the Lord's Word with you this morning. So, we're in 2 Peter chapter 2, and chapter 1, and we are at this part of the chapter where Peter is confirming the supernatural revelation of God. And that's extremely important. We live in a world today where 2 plus 2 equals 5. And when, and when we read the Bible, 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's what we like and that's what we want. Uh, we need to cling to that as never before. 2 plus 2 equals 4, not 5. Alright, so, let's quickly reorientate ourselves. Peter, he's nearing his death. He, he is writing to uh, people in what we would call modern day Turkey. Uh, the Roman provinces of Asia, Bithynia, Cappadocia, um, Asia Minor, and they're, they're all provinces of Turkey. Now, if you were to go there today, you would hardly find a Christian to speak of. You'd find all Muslims and that type of thing. And so, we, 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 we should be soberly reminded that we're only one generation away from extinction, really. And when all of us die, who's left? The same thing's happening to Australia. We don't see lots of people becoming Christians today. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. But one of the reasons is people do not take the Word of God seriously. That's one of the reasons. And we'll show you today why you should take the Word of God seriously. Because it is supernaturally a revelation from God. It is a sure word and it is to be trusted implicitly. It is to be believed it is to be obeyed and followed. More so, probably, than ever. Now, um, so Simon Peter, he writes this, and the real problem that he's trying to address these uh, Christians with, they're pilgrims, they're sojourning, they're away from their country, uh, they have the faith of Christ, but they're under pressure of persecution, and he's trying to get them to realise the real problem you're going to have is false teaching or false teachers coming into your church and spreading uh, error. Uh, to shore your minds up from the error, you need to know a number of things. Uh, you need to know your salvation. The key word in this chapter is the word knowledge. Things you need to know. Uh, you'll see the word knowledge, we'll see it again today. It is repeated four or five times. We need to know. We need to know things. You need to know your salvation. You need to know you're elect. You need to know that the transfer of God's righteousness has come to you. You need to know that God has given you great and precious promises. You need to know that you're a partaker of the divine nature. You need to know that you have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. You need to know all of that. And you, you need to know, besides that, you need to supply to that faith seven virtues. Now, if you don't know those seven virtues, 
How can you supply them? You have to know them. So, Dick's not here, so he could rattle them off, so I hope you all can. I won't put pressure on you, but if this was a class at the police academy, I would have. <laughs> all right? So, um, I will give you homework today. Um, anyway, we need to know uh, the fact that we're sanctified. We need to know uh, we, we add to our, our faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, love. We need to know that. For if these things are in you, he says, and abound, they make that you will neither be unfruitful or barren in your service to the Lord. So if you don't know what you need to supply to the faith that God has given you, you will be short-sighted and blind, and you won't be able to see afar off in your spiritual walk. And you'll, you'll have even forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. The world will distract you terribly. And Peter's saying you don't need to get in that situation. You need to be abundant in your salvation, abundant in your walk, walk with the Lord. And the other thing you need to know is, and he's, oh yeah, he makes the point. Um, look, uh, while I'm here with you, I'm going to remind you of these things. I just did again, didn't I? It's probably the third time, fourth time I've done that. I'm going to remind you of all these things. And even though you already know them, I'll just keep saying them. Because this is the Christian walk. Uh, while I am in this tabernacle, this earthly tabernacle. In other words, um, he, he says, look at yourselves as temporary. Look at your bodies as temporary. Uh, you, you're a Christian now. You're part of two worlds, two kingdoms. You've got one foot on terra firma, but your, your real life is in the kingdom of God, the spiritual realm. So you straddle both of those. And you better be careful that you make sure your real life is concentrated in the kingdom of God. Otherwise, the world, uh, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, uh, the pride of life will take hold of you. And it will spoil your spiritual work. Just remember, you're temporary. You're in a tent. It's fading. One of my favourite themes. Oh, another year. See, we're older. Okay, we're fading more and more temporary all the time. Now, he says, you need to know that. And he says, you need to know not only your salvation, not only your sanctification, you need to know that when you read the Bible, you have a sure word from God in your hands. What is going from the pages of Scripture into your mind and hopefully into your walk is a sure word from God Almighty. You need to know that. Otherwise, when the false teachers come along into your churches, into your, remember the world is controlled by the evil one and all he wants to do is destroy the churches and he is doing that probably the worst I've seen in my lifetime. In my lifetime. Okay? So, um, and so you really need to know that what you have in your hand, you need to know the scripture. You need to know it is sure and true. And last time I was with you, I gave you one of, Peter uses two strands. Two strands to show you that you have the supernatural revelation from God. And the first strand he used is, was his own experience. He said that, look, we, we didn't follow cunningly devised fables or Greek legends when we made known unto you the power and coming, the second coming doctrine of the Lord, we were what? Eyewitnesses. And I went into big detail on how there were three levels of witnesses and he was the top level of witness you could ever get. And um, he says, I was there, I saw the Lord on the Mount of Transfig Transfiguration. I heard the voice of God. I saw Moses and Elijah. I heard what they were saying. And this fascinates me because ex-cop, we always, witnesses, courts and all that, it's all that world. All right? And it's not only that. Um, I like to think about these things. Occasionally, occasionally, um, I, someone shouts me a ticket to go to some um, play or theatre or something, and I get excited. Because it's not a thing I shout myself. 
And so someone sent me Beauty and the Beast, so we're the whole family, uh, Christian lady, lovely Christian lady, so we went off to that and I, I got all excited and I said, how can I milk the most out of this that I can? You know, I was tuned. Uh, someone, uh, what's that, Lion King, we went and saw that and uh, the ballet down in Wollongong, my daughter shouted me a ticket, we sat there and I had my sketchbook and all this sort of stuff and how can I milk the most? But let me tell you something about eyewitnesses and please know that. I get a little bit frustrated because there's so much going on, you can only what? You can only, where do I look? <laughs> okay, where do I look? I, I want to see it all. I asked a theatre fellow about this once and he gave me a very good explanation, but I can't remember it. Uh, <laughs> so I'll ask him again, he's in my art class, so I'll ask him again when I get back. Um, it was, sounded really good. I thought, you know, what they're trying to do to you. But you can only concentrate on one thing at a time. And if you read Luke's account and uh, Matthew's account, they're slightly different. One of them heard what Moses and Elijah were talking about, Christ's impending death. The other one doesn't even mention it. So, so the eyewitness account, as good as it is, as good as it is, you can't take it all in. All right? You can only take in certain aspects. You pick and choose. And, um, and Peter says... Well, but I was an eyewitness. I, I, I received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice. I heard that voice. Uh, Luke, uh, Luke didn't hear it. It was related to Luke. And this voice, he was a second-hand witness writing it down. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were in, with him in the holy mount. The word we there is important. The we there is the apostles. Peter, James, John, we, emphatic, we heard. We were the ones that heard the voices and we saw Christ transfigured before us. We saw uh, a mini version of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now we're writing it down. Okay, it's not second hand, it's first hand. And then he says where we are today. But, or, but, we have, King James doesn't quite get the Greek right here, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy. Now, oh, in, the, in the Greek, it's a bit like Spanish, you, you flip it round. We have more sure the prophetic word. Okay? But we have more sure the prophetic word. But we have more sure the prophetic word. So these two strands... These two strands that the revelation from God is supernatural is Peter saying, I was a top level eyewitness seeing the prefiguring of the second coming of Christ. I saw it, I wrote it down. The second strand, there's another way that God communicates to the human race and that is the prophetic word, more sure. More sure than what? I'm going to say experience. Some people interpret this by saying, oh, we had an experience and that made the prophetic word more sure. Okay, so that puts experience above the prophetic word. No, I won't, I won't go into the argument about it. Uh, I'll just knock it on the head. Okay, the supernatural revelation always dictates to the experience. And I told you why the experience is weak, didn't I? Because you're there looking, you can't take it all in, can you? Supernatural revelation from God, in, on the other hand, is you are getting the very breath of God formed into words. That's different. That's a sure word. And we know, um, as Christians, uh, the importance God puts on his word. Um, Psalm, Psalm 19, we all know, the law of the Lord is Perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are true and right, altogether, and on and on and on. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, the much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb, and by them is your servant warned. It's everything to God that his word is to be trusted and sure. 
John 17, 7, the Lord himself, thy word is truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Two plus two equals four. And he says, we have the prophetic word, we, and now this, this we here is different. This is, this is different. This is not emphatic. It's passive. This is, this is every Christian. We all now... He says, when I had the experience, it was Peter, James and John, that we. Now this we here is all believers of all ages who are going to be come out by all sorts of error. I want you to know, he says, that you have a prophetic word more sure. More sure. Now, prophetic word. Rather than me bring my big bulky vines, I photographed it. <laughs> and I can't, I can't memorize it any better than this. I can't say it any better than this. Um, just turn while I'm turning to this. Turn to Luke 24, please. Luke 24. What is the prophetic word? When we think, and this is why you have to be um, careful with. Just reading uh, King James in particular. Luke 24. Dea. Emmaus Road. Okay. So here. This is out of the Vines Expository Dictionary. Listen carefully, please. So this is what is more sure than any person's experience or anything like that. Uh, Prophetia is the Greek word. It signifies the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. What verse? What verse? Uh, I'll, I'll get there in a minute. Yeah. I'll just confirm what I'm... The, I'll give you the definition first, and then I'll confirm it with uh, the Lord on the Emmaus Road. So... What is it? It's the sp what is prophetia? It's not just so a prediction of the future or something like that. That's part of it. And in a sense, all scripture is that. Um, it is the speaking forth of the mind and counsel of God. Through much of the Old Testament prophecy was, though much of it was purely, purely predictive. For unto us a child is born, unto us. That's predictive, isn't it? of Christ's first coming, though much of it was purely predictive, um, Micah 5.2, what's that? Uh, but thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though there be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me. In other words, Micah said, Bethlehem will be the town where the Messiah comes from. Okay, that's predictive. Though much of it was predictive, prophecy is not necessarily, nor even primarily, foretelling the future. Uh, it is the, this is so important, it is the declaration of that which cannot be known by natural means. So what do you got in your hands? You have words that cannot be known by natural means. In other words, they are supernatural revelation from God. I don't know what that does to you, but since I've been eight years old, it's done a lot to me. <laughs> and it's, I, I get, when I pick up that book, I am constantly remind myself of what I'm reading. It's that which cannot be known by natural means. It is the voice of God. Uh, keep reading. It is the fourth telling of the will of God. Do you know what, want to know what the will of God is? Read the Bible. Whether with reference to the past, the present, or the future. In other words, a whole lot. Now, let's see that practically in the Bible. Luke 24. Um, I love the Lord. I've been listening to some sermons on John. <laughs> and the thing I got out of it was... What Jesus did didn't offend anyone. Everyone loves that. You see all these pictures of Jesus with little children and 
or uh, feeding the 5,000. No one gets offended by that, do they? Oh, that's lovely. But as soon as Jesus opens his mouth and speaks words, they really get offended. All right? Okay. How'd you like the Lord to say this to you? Then he said unto, verse 25, Then he said unto them, disciples, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets. So what are we looking at? The prophetic word made sure, more sure. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In other words, read the Old Testament. You should have known this. That's the only Bible they had in those days, remember? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. What's the Bible about? Jesus Christ. The whole Bible is about Jesus Christ. Uh, go over to verse 44. And he uh, just eaten the fish. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law. So we've got the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms. The whole lot is the prophetic word of God. So Peter who knew, he quotes the Old Testament all the time, he's saying, when you, when you pick up what I'm writing, when you pick up the Old Testament, and when you pick up what would be written after me, Peter's saying, you are holding in your hands the prophetic word of God made more sure. You are holding that which cannot be known by natural means. Alrighty. You need to know that because you're going to have a lot of people coming at you with other ideas. And so, uh, back to uh, Peter please, Second Peter chapter 1. We have this more sure uh, word of prophecy. And then what does he say? Is that in the right spot? Okay. Okay. Uh, we have this more sure word of prophecy I know they wrote on skins and all that in those days they're just symbols okay unto which you do well to what pay attention okay unto which you do well not only well, well means right, unto which you do right and excellent. You want to do something excellent or right or well in your life, pay attention to the more sure word of God. You've done right if you do that. And, and then, he, then he gives a metaphor, as unto a what? A light that shineth in a dark place. Okay, so beautiful pictures. How could I not, not draw a list of? I have to. So the more sure, more sure is like a, oh, I'll do some sort of a light. Desk lamp, maybe. As unto a light, that shineth in a what's the world? It's a dark place. <laughs> it's getting darker by the day. Spiritually, it is really dark. Uh, dark. The word dark came to me murky. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path unto which you do right or well that you pay attention to that or you won't be able to find your way it actually does two things it guides me through a dark murky place and it exposes the dark murky place for what it is 
A person will never, ever be converted until they see themselves as a lost, alienated from God, uh, completely ignorant sinner. Unless they see that, and unless they come to a point where, the, where this light, that's why we say they've seen the light. The Word of God is the only thing that shines in this world and exposes a person for what he is. I can't stand this gospel that avoids the mention of sin. Just tack Jesus onto your life. He loves you. That's not the full gospel. It's not what the light says. Unto which you do well that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. Now, until, until, key word, something happens. So here, here's the, we've got, actually, we've got tenses here. You know English, past, present, future? Hey, we're on the, <laughs> we love English, don't we? <laughs> uh, let's do the past. Uh, let's do the present. Let's do the future. So if he says, we, all of us, passive, we have a more sure, have a, what's that, what tense? Present, correct? Right now, here, we have a light that shineth in a dark place. There it is. It's not the actual book, it's the words. Um, that shineth in a dark place, unto which you do well to take heed, to guide you through life, and to shine a light on the world and show it as it is. Then he says, until something happens in the what? Future. future. Something's going to happen in the future until the day dawn and the day star arises, or the morning star arises in your hearts. Tricky. <clears throat> All right, you ready? <laughs> Paying attention? Here we go. Who likes astronomy? I do. Yeah, I, I love it. Particularly with all the apps you get on your telephone now. It's exciting. And this one is particularly exciting to me. That's why, in a sense, this is a little bit easy for me because I've been looking at this morning star for years as I came down here to Goulburn in the winter months. The morning star is... Venus. What? Yes, it's Jesus. But in Greek astronomy, the morning star is Venus. Now, I get up very early in the morning. I go to bed very early too. But those of you that get up very early in the morning, not now, summer months, but in the autumn, winter, spring, you will see a very very bright star in the northeast sky about that far on the horizon. Not up there, just about there. And that star is Venus. Now, where I'll orientate myself. Say I'm at Lloyd's place. That star will be above the police academy in the north sky. David's place would be just go over the above Rocky Hill, a bit to the left. Are we all orientated? So please, I'll, if you remind me, I'll tell you to look for this star. It is so bright. It's not even a star in one sense because it's a planet. It's Venus. It's really bright. And why I know it so well is I used to have to get up early to catch the train to come down here to go to the police academy to earn a living. And I would walk from my place to the railway station, all, oh, it's just there, and I left shining like crazy. Morning Venus. And nowadays I, I can lie in bed a little bit more, I just look out my window, there she is, hi Venus. <laughs> in the Bible, um, that's called, who's the bright and morning star? Jesus. Jesus. So, so let's, let's see. 
let's have the terrain like this. There's that. So we have a desk lamp or a small lamp until what? The morning star who is We're talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And what, what, what's so exciting about Venus, I do like all it. When I look at all this stuff, I'm looking at God's creation. That's why I get excited. Mm. You know, I get that creation magazine. I love all creation. I love anatomy. I love all, all anything to do with what God created. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. And when, if you look across, where's Lloyd's place? If you look across, when you see Venus and you look across over to there, the northwest, you'll see an orange one. That's Mars. The orange one is always Mars. So Venus and Mars are always together. You won't see them now because they're there, but it's too light. You've got you to have the winter and the spring and the autumn and all that. Okay, and I love all that because in art you've always got paintings of who? Venus and Mars. And that's why we get, we know what Venus is, because it comes from Greek mythology. Anyway, so in the Bible it's Jesus, just before the day dawn. What's the day dawn? I'm glad Dick's not here, he probably, <laughs> Presbyterians wouldn't like me saying this, but it's the coming millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. They believe in a... Um, we're in that kingdom now. Okay, so the kingdom. Before Christ comes and set up his kingdom, before he comes to set up his kingdom, Christ comes and then his kingdom follows straight away. The, the, the day star, we know when we see Christ, we know the kingdom is here. And when that kingdom is here, um, the... Um, it, it, the day star will of what? What will happen to me if I'm around as a believer or I'm coming with Christ? What happens? It arises in my heart. Just read it. It arises in my heart. So is that a positive thing? Yes, it is. I will, when this all happens, I won't need that anymore. That's, that's until this happens, then I will be known even as I am known. I will be a perfect reflection of the righteousness and glory of God in His kingdom. That doesn't excite you, nothing will. <laughs> We're full of hope. We're full of expectation. Until the day dawn, the day dawn and the day star arises in your hearts. It's a wonderful thing. But until then, what do we have? A more sure word, a more sure prophetic word of that which cannot be known by human means. Now, just to make sure you understand how that works, he says, for this came not in old time by the will of man. That's why Vine says, it's, it can't be known by natural means. It, it, no will of man invented what you have in your hands. It's supernatural. You need it. And he says, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we call, this is the revelation. Uh, so we've got the future. Now he going, he's going back to where? Past. He says, I'm going to tell you how you actually got that more sure word. So, present, future, past. So here it goes. This is how it happens. And the word moved is the key. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by <coughs> the Holy Spirit. That's where we get the word inspiration. The Bible is an inspired book, and that works like this. The word moved means born along, born along, carried along. I used to use the illustration of, a, remember when you're a kid and you threw a paddle pop stick when it rained a lot and the gutters were full and flowing, you'd throw a little stick in and watch it travel along. 
The stick had no control over its... It was just carried along by the overflowing gutters. But here's, a, here's another way to think of it. Imagine a, a holy man of God in a boat, Jeremiah, in a boat, here's the water. This is what inspiration means. He puts up a sail. No rudder. Okay? The wind, wind blow. By the way, the word spirit is pneuma, from which we get pneumatic, pneumatics, drills, you know, pneumatic. Okay? Air. Like that. So, the Holy Spirit. So, a writer of the Old Testament, say Jeremiah. He puts up the sails to write. And he doesn't steer or anything. He just puts it up. He's there. So, you've got this twofold. You've got the Holy Spirit involved and you've got a holy man of God involved. And this is how it works. He puts up the sail and the Holy Spirit comes and just moves that boat wherever he wills. And so we have written down in words what God wanted written down. And this man would be able to say these words. Speech bubble. The word of the who? Lord. Great. Came to me. It's not a holy man of prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It came to him from the Lord saying And then they write it down. You often wonder where they fell and you think, we wouldn't have a clue. We'll have to ask them where we get to heaven. Did he feel some electricity or something? We don't know. Uh, no idea. But what we do know, and the, the way I like to think of Scripture is this, is the actual Holy Spirit <sighs> breathing words and men writing it down, not of their own will, saying. So, the, the breath of God formed into words is what I have in my hands in Scripture. Wow! That's exciting. So, Peter says, better know your salvation, you better know your sanctification, and you better know that when you open the Bible, you, every, every word is inspired. Not in this King James, there might have been some little uh, uh, English translation. I told you one there in First Peter was a bit funny. The original writings, every single word is the breath of God formed into words. It is without any error and it is infallible. And that's sure in a very unsure world. And I just have the greatest respect uh, uh, for how this came to me. I, I, I'm in awe of it. I hope you are too. And as homework, um, and out of sheer respect for those that gave it to us in English, I would like you this week, because I'll be here next week and checking, um, either you watch a YouTube doco or you read a book, get on Wikipedia or whatever, but learn the story of William Tyndale. William Tyndale. Okay? So if you've read it before, read it again. Okay? Because I hate to see people careless with the Bible because I know, because you know a little bit of history, you know what it cost Peter, it cost him his life, and I know what it cost Tyndale, and I know what it cost a lot of other people. Just for us to sit here in beautiful Australia to have this in our hands today, that which cannot be known by natural means. We need that. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. We, we are truly blessed to say that we have in our hands uh, the written word of the living God. In Christ's name we pray that you will bless it to us. In his name, amen.